January 3rd, 2023 uh, meeting of the DRB to order. Um, starting on my right, introduce the board members. Kevin O'Connell, board member. Rob Goodwin, the chair. Meredith Crandall, staff. Karen Allen, vice chair. Catherine Burgess, board member. Joe Kiernan, board member. Abby White, board member. And we have Michael on remote meeting. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Michael Lazorchak, board member. First order of business is to have Meredith brief us on our remote meeting procedures for tonight's meeting. Which is going to be important tonight. All right, so I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, and the share screen is really more for um, people who are watching this over Orca Media. But there will be some stuff in the little spiel that will be important for anybody attending remotely. Um, oh, the date was wrong on there. All right. So for anyone who is viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's development review board meeting via the Zoom platform. Um, you can either type this link into your web browser um, and that will bring you right into the Zoom meeting and I'll just have to let you in. I'll see a little pop-up come up or you can call this phone number and when prompted, punch in this meeting ID. Um, if you're trying to get into the meeting and you're having problems with it, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier hyphen vt.org. I'll be monitoring my email throughout the meeting and we'll do my best to help you get in the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning on your video is optional. If you are having issues with your audio cutting in and out, sometimes turning your video off will actually um, improve the audio. For everyone attending, please do your best to keep your microphone on mute when you aren't speaking. This will cut down on background noise. Um, and as I said a little bit earlier, um, if you're dialing in on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, please reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions only. Anything substantive will need to be um, shared verbally. You can um, raise your hand, either using the raise hand button on Zoom or physically raise your hand if your camera's on. We will be watching for those, those hands. Um, there, there are more than one of us in here um, on the Zoom, so we're, we'll all be keeping our eyes on that. Um, and please uh, make sure to wait to start speaking until the chair calls on you. And especially the first time you do speak, please make sure to state your full name. Um, and if possible, also your address, um, especially if you're someone who has not already submitted written comments. Um, I think we'll we'll leave it to the different applications to, to talk about managing time for the number of people, number of comments we have, because we have two very different applications tonight. Um, please note that in the event there are issues where the public is unable to access tonight's meeting, um, the relevant hearings will need to be continued to a time, place, and certain. I will now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Thank you, Meredith. Approval of the agenda. So moved. Motion from Kevin. Second by Sharon. All those in favor say aye. 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 We have an agenda for tonight. Uh, we have two applications uh, this evening. Um, I'll be uh, the chair for the first one, and then I'll be turning it over to uh, Sharon uh, for the College of Fine Arts uh, application. Uh, she is the vice chair, and I will not be in attendance. Um, so the next order of business here is we have minutes from the December 5th meeting to uh, review and approve. Anyone have any comments? Move to approve the minutes from the December 5th meeting. Motion by Sharon. Second. Second by Joe. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes for December 5th uh, have been approved. I believe, uh, Mr. Cody, are you in the room? Yeah. What do you prefer, uh, Bob, or Mr. Cody? <laughs> all right, perfect. You might, might as well come on up to the. the, the chair in front of the computer. I'm right at the round table and make sure to speak as clearly as you can into the microphone so that yeah. 
Courtney's here as well. Courtney is. Courtney is on remotely. I am here. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you just want to introduce yourself into the microphone and then Courtney do the same. I'm Robert Cody. I'm from the Cody Cadillac on the very Montpelier Road, 364 River Street. And I am Courtney Boutan. I'm with SB Signs um, in Williston. Um, so um, were you both be providing testimony this evening? Yes. As needed, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to um, you know, swear you in for your testimony on the application. Um, so um, do you stand or just raise your right hand is fine. And, uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. As do I. I do. Thank you. Um, all right. So, Meredith, do you want to go for a quick overview here? Uh, hit, the, hit the high points, and then uh, Bob will let you do a presentation and sort of give us a okay. summary on your uh, application. Thank you. Um, so, this application is before the Development Review Board um, because the as zoning administrator, I can't approve um, moving a non-conforming sign um, and and keeping that sign non-conforming. Um, so hey, Rick, could you please mute yourself? We've got you coming on over the speakers. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the the existing sign that Cody wants to shift back and repair and replace the underlying structure, the support structure, um, is currently higher than allowed under the existing regulations and larger in area. Um, and we also, our current regs only allow one ground sign per parcel. And there's currently at least two on that parcel. So I can't prove those things and there's no waiver provisions in our sign provision um, where the, the planning department is aware that this is a, an issue that we should have some sort of waiver provision in there, um, but there isn't one. So there's no waiver option. The only option to try to shift the existing signs so or the sign panels, keep them at the same height is to come forward and try and ask for a variance. Um, variances by state statute are really limited in scope. Um, they usually have to apply to something to do with um, the physical arrangement of the site, something to do with either the size of the site or the geology on the site. Um, and so that's why this is before the board to decide whether or not they can grant the variance that Cody Chevrolet is requesting. Okay, thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Bob, you want to just give it? Sure. Um, the sign that we're, which basically what it is, is we're replacing the sign because it's, uh, I don't own the signs. The signs are leased from a company, GMDI. <clears throat> and the sign has been determined that it's faulty underneath and it's failing. So they want to replace it with the same exact size sign that's been there since, I don't know, 1981, 82. I have to look it up. Um, and the other sign that's on the property, the Cadillac sign, again, all of those were permitted before and passed. I don't believe that the current law or, or the current the statute that came forth in the last few years properly addresses this. Um, Cody Chevrolet has a road frontage of at least 750 feet. The signs are not huge. They, they actually, GM actually makes a bigger sign than the one that we're requesting to put up. Um, and basically all we're trying to do is replace what's already there. And it's not, uh, go buy Domino's. That's a pretty God darn big sign for a very small piece of property. <laughs> and ours is, you know, I, I bet you people drive by and don't even notice our sign. So I, that that's basically, I, I just don't think that when they wrote the statute that they took into consideration that I'm not looking for a grandfather, but we're not reinventing anything here. We're just putting back something that's already existing, replacing with something new, but it's going to look identical to what's there. They'll take up the same footprint. Um, it's not obtrusive. It doesn't block anybody's view. Um, I don't know all of, uh, you know, I mean, 
we're willing to make some concessions if the sign has to be pushed back a few feet from the road front, things like that. But basically for, for me, um, I'm just kind of disappointed. I've been a good citizen of Montpelier for 61 years. My family has, Cody Charlie's been in existence since 1956, paid several years of taxes. I'm a Montpelier resident by choice. Um, my wife is an employee of the city. Um, I, I just think that, you know, the Bashara Cody family has done pretty God darn good by the uh, city of Montpelier. And I just kind of feel kind of like, wow, it's just a sign. Just trying to replace the same sign. So that's why I'm asking for a variance. Otherwise, you know, if I was asking for something special, if we were coming out with a brand new sign or anything, then I, I totally, I totally get the, you know, the loss. But right now, I, I don't think that that takes into consideration something that's already existing. And I've talked to several people that are in business and they're surprised by that. They're surprised that I can't just replace the same sign that I already have. But so that's what we asked for the variance. Um, and we respectfully uh, thank you for your time. And I don't know if Cordy has anything to add. Yeah, if, if I can chime in really briefly, um, it sounds like if the pole were the only element that were being changed and everything else was staying the same, that this would fall under maintenance. And one of the big differences with this project is that the foundation itself is no longer considered by engineering to be up to standard. And so it, it's complicated this a little bit because if it were just the pole that was failing um, because of rusting, we wouldn't be here before you. It would just be a maintenance um, issue. But because the, the concrete foundation is involved, it's added this extra layer where we have to move it for a new foundation. Um, but as Bob said, it's the same exact sign, same size, same pole height, same everything that's going in, just with a, a foundation that meets current engineering standards. As he said, that the sign that's there is maybe 40 years old um, and engineering standards have changed. And um, the pole itself is also um, considered unsafe at this point. So um, piggybacking on what Bob said, um, it's the same thing, just a few feet away. <laughs> So the replacement of the sign in place, that's the extent of the scope of your request here. Yeah, just, just replace yeah. the same sign that's already there. It just it shifts back like yeah. an extra 10 feet. Yeah, I think yeah. it's something to do with the um, closeness to the road. And like I said, we're willing to concede that. Mm -hmm. So the location is changing? The location Just backing up away from the road, just a larger setback. And that's at the request of whatever the... Um, yeah, that actually Statutor. moving it back actually brings the distance from the front property line into conformance with that requirement. Yeah. Again, all these requirements have changed in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Because in 1981 or 82, when the sign was originally erected, mm -hmm. it, it was put in the proper place. If it wasn't, we would have put it in the proper place. So just a question for Meredith here. So the, the point at which you go from replacing the pole to the foundation is that <laughs> it, it it's how you we don't have anything that tells us what normal repair and maintenance is mm -hmm. i did not feel as a zoning administrator mm -hmm. that completely changing out the entire foundation because you do have to shift it at least some to build put in the new foundation correct you can't put that new foundation in the exact same place where it is right now it was my we could, but then then it would also interfere with your setback the, yep. the it, it would have made regulations yeah, yeah the new the new uh foundation would have been imposing more on the setback so it's it just it it to me it was something that was beyond normal repair and maintenance right it's not a fixing a broken um sign panel it's not fixing a broken light um so you we, know it's go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> yeah so so to clarify meredith if this if this was a damage to a pole and we were just fixing that it wouldn't require all of this no, here's, here's the, so if it was if it, here's the thing if it was definitely if it was clear damage from like an incident right yeah there's a there's an issue there's a there's a clause in here to deal with when somebody's sign gets blown down in a storm or something I'm, the replacing the whole foundation 
with a new foundation to me didn't fall under normal repair and maintenance. If you guys disagree with that. Well, then there's the question. I mean, we're, we're still dealing with a relatively new ordinance here. Oh yeah. Uh, where, I mean, do we have any way of knowing or documenting what the thinking was on the part of the planning commission and the council at the time? Um, so I know that part of it was that they did not want to keep grandfathering signs that were bigger than what they wanted, at least from the planning commission, right? That's why the specific grandfather clauses for things like the restaurant sign, um, on top of the old lobster pot that got removed in 2018. There used to be a specific grandfathered clause for that sign specifically that was removed. So if they do, they do something to upgrade the lighting on that, to modernize the lighting, they then have to try and bring it into conformance. They can't modernize the lighting on that sign without bringing the whole sign into conformance. And there's that sign is immensely too big. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was a definite desire to bring parcels and signs into conformity. Now, on the other hand, (laughs) uh, you know, the planning director and I have had lots of conversations that the sign provision needs work, specifically the sizes allowed for signs that the way this was originally drafted doesn't take into consideration things like different speed limits at faster speeds you need bigger signs um you know different out there on the barrymont pillar road that is a much different location than other places further in um even in the same zoning district so you know mike and i know we have work to do on it um but this is one of the one of the few that's really triggered a problem i can only think that that Part of their thinking may have been in relation to a a sign that was built that was clearly out of conformity, uh, without naming names. Um, I'm just wondering if we, if we, if that came into play and if we could interpret without taking up a whole bunch of the board's time <laughs> to uh, use this use the precedent of the existing uh, to, to just say, go, go for it. I, um, I'm undecided on this. I sympathize with your case. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, common sense to me. Um, we have this staff report here that has uh, regulations in it and section uh, 3012 is on signs. And if I'm reading this right, and it's even been bolded, no changes beyond normal repair and maintenance shall be allowed to the structure or framing, and the non-conforming sign shall not be relocated. So that's part of uh, section F here, which is longer. Um, and it does say that here, I mean, maybe I should just read it in its entirety, but it's it's there for anyone to read it. Um, non-conforming signs may not be altered, modified, or reconstructed unless, and then there are three unlesses, A, the change brings the sign into conformance with the regulations, which is not the case here, or B, the modification does not change the area, I think we do check off that box, and is limited to changes to the sign panel, including the replacement of a sign panel, replacing individual letters or logos within the same area, or repainting a sign face. And then it says no changes beyond normal repair and maintenance shall be allowed to the structure of framing. I would consider the pole to be part of the structure and framing. Um, so I don't know where found that if the pole was damaged or if the pole needed replacing you, it would not oh, fall. Oh, so different. Okay. There's a different one about um, allowing certain Repairs. Yeah, so that's the C, reconstruction of the sign, right? So if there's been damage to a sign and you're reconstructing it, um, you're allowed within a certain cost window. Yeah, and it's 30, the cost window is 30% of the replacement value of the sign immediately prior to damage, which is pretty difficult, I think, to determine what a sign is worth before it was damaged. Um, And can, can I jump in really quickly? I'm sorry. 
this is Courtney, sorry. Um, so I think it's from, from when I was reading the regulations, it's a little hazy when it comes to what constitutes damage. So is, you know, it, it doesn't really state is damage a truck hitting your sign or is damage rusting because of weather conditions or is damage a face being blown out in a windstorm or is it only if, you know, the sign is vandalized? Um, you know, in the, the maintenance provision, you know, from our understanding, we, we install signs in just about every town in the state. And, you know, every town has their own interpretations to an extent. <clears throat> but um, we've always, always been able to change anything that was a problem with the sign, in part because it's a hazard. You know, if a sign falls over because the pole is rusted, or if the sign tips over because the foundation isn't adequate and the, you know, the cement has cracked or it has aged, you know, that's a safety issue and that requires fixing the sign. And I think that what, um, what Cody Chevrolet has tried to do is said, you know, we know this has to be replaced. We also know that, you know, regulations have changed and we're sort of, we're, we're respecting as much as we can the need to come into compliance as much as we can by moving the sign back, um, you know, so the setback is brought up to code, up to the the current regulations. You know, we're doing our part to do what we can to um, to say, hey, we respect that the, the the regs have changed, but all we're doing is fixing the things that are a problem. You know, the the sign is rusting. The sign could fall over, and and that's that's sort of our goal and intent there. If that makes sense, it does <clears throat> it does? Um... I suppose it would be on the board then to determine whether, you know, metal rusts and concrete deteriorates is replacing those two things, normal repair and maintenance as per the regulations. Yeah, and I think, I think can you assume that a sign will eventually, the pole will rust away? Well, I think a key point here is is that there's the provision of if you're bringing it into conformity. So if there was to do a replacement of the sign and all of the criteria would have bring it into be conforming versus like height, size, uh, and set, you know, and setback, all of those criteria, it seems like a potentially a pathway. Is that correct? Well, that's one pathway. You don't have to do that if what you're doing is repair and maintenance. Yeah. Right. Those so are there's, two there's separate. These, this is why this, this is yeah. this is the whole conundrum of my getting here to be like, I don't see a path that I can sure. take. Yeah. Um, but to get them to apply for the variance gets them here sooner than my issue saying no to the permit and them having to appeal it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's the pathway of bring the whole sign into conformance, which means make it smaller, make it shorter, which is a problem for Cody. Mm -hmm. Um, or the try and, um, some, you know, whether or not the board feels comfortable saying this kind of work, because eventually things degrade, is repair and maintenance, right? And those those are two potential pathways here. Um, because I mean, it's one of the things. Sometimes I interpret something one way, and the board disagrees with me, and so then I use the board's precedent for later applications. Okay, Kevin. Yeah. So um, the the signs you okay, you're you're replacing the existing sign with a new sign, same dimensions. What is the face of the new signs? Looks just like the same one. Yeah. You're not putting an LED lit. Uh, I don't know that board. Though. I think Courtney would it's, have. I think that yeah, it's already, already it's already it's already LED now. It was upgraded. It's already a lit sign, so it will, in appearance, if you didn't know that it moved a little bit over, you wouldn't know that it's a new sign. Um, there's no changes to the artwork. There's no changes to the size. Nothing. It's all the same. Thank you. Question: The height is different. Is that true? It's going to be no. I, I think there's a there's a I think it what it is is there might be a few inches um, difference in how the this the plans measured it because the original height measurement um, I think was maybe a. Uh, more of an estimate you know they knew generally how tall it was whereas the new spec sheet i have a feeling has the exact height on it okay. i think that's why there's probably i had to put it in the staff report but i think that's why it says there's a few inches difference okay all right 
Right. So in the staff report, it says one thing, but in reality, it's probably I think in reality roughly the same. And yeah, I think in reality, it's probably the same. Okay. <laughs> the, the intention is the same height. Okay. With yeah. the new sign. Yeah. And can I just ask whether the um it was moved back? Is that because you guys wanted to move it back? Or, no. Uh, or I did think you it, suggest I, it? it? It was a part of trying to be, you know conform with uh, the setback. Yeah, no trying to have at least one thing that in in <laughs> redoing the sign, they come into conformity with one, create one of the dimensional requirements. Can I ask if the council's all familiar with frontage of Cody Chevrolet? Yes. Because okay. yeah, uh, I mean, you just where the sign is now. I think um, according to correct it wrong, moving it back ten feet. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that was the approximate. It's moving it back. It's it's quite close to the road right now and it's just going to slide back into i believe it's an existing parking spot right. i mean yeah. it, when, when i when i go by cody chevrolet and i look at um actually when i go down the Bearmont bay road which i've done for 43 years now i see telephone poles that are crooked i see all kinds of different things um and to be quite, you know, Frank, I'm, I, I know it may sound selfish, but moving the sign or putting the same sign in this place, if it was done at midnight, nobody would know the difference. <laughs> but we don't do things that way. So, um, you know, I, I, it just, you know, I, I honestly think that that the people that wrote the statutes or did, did not take into consideration something like this happening. And, um, you know, I, I don't think there was any evil intent. I just think that they didn't anticipate this that otherwise I wouldn't even be here asking for the variance. Go ahead, Catherine. Could you talk us through, you know, we have we're talking about the height, size, and setback is sure. what would bring it into compliance. So the new setback brings it into compliance. I might have missed it in the staff report, but what would the compliant height and size be in comparison to what you have so, right now? Um they would probably have to go to the, the next size sign, which is much smaller. And um Quite frankly, a dealership of our size, with that road frontage, most Chevrolet dealerships have the size even bigger than the one we're requesting. Just it's just standard. So we we actually um, most General Motors dealerships standard would five hundred something feet of frontage or more have a bigger, much larger sign. Um, I, you'd have to go around the state to see the different ones, but um, they all look identical. They're just different sizes. Am I correct, Courtney? This is the middle size. Yeah, we we install for a lot of different dealerships, and and this is a smaller. Um, the height is pretty standard, but I think the sign, the faces are quite. And the Cadillac it's on the smaller side. I, excuse me. The Cadillac sign that's on the edge of our property. We also own the property next door, which is Dosha. Heck, I can move the sign over there, but mm -hmm. uh, that sign itself is uh, is is a very very small sign. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one on. Uh, Another piece of property that we own, which is the body shop, which is on a different piece of property. That's why that there's only two signs on our property. The third one is a is a truck sign that we have to have for because we're a commercial truck. Mm -hmm. So we have that over by the trucks. But that, those two signs are the same size. They're very small compared to the one in the in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the one in the middle, like, like I said, I believe was eight eight by eight. Is that correct, uh, Courtney? Maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, yeah, eight hold on just one second. It is which isn't much bigger than that screen right there yeah it's six six feet four inches square so it's yeah, a, so on the smaller so side look at that screen there that's about what six feet by six feet so it's not it's not it's not a huge sign we're talking about mm -hmm. road frontage of like i said about 700 and something feet and that's just cody chevrolet i'm not counting my my body shop property which is even further but yeah. the whole visual effect of driving on Route 302, it's a very small sign. Um, it's not that intrusive or obtrusive. And the last thing I want to say is that's 40 miles an hour that right. people drive by. I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's, um, you know, it's that, that big of a deal, but I, I understand that things change. Yeah, did you want to just admit that question that you asked? I thought it was relevant. What what would that sign in compliance look like? What what yep. size would that be? So um the a compliant sign would be no more than 32 square feet, I think is what I've got on here. Um and then uh, it would be 12 feet in height for those units. And what's the height now? I'm sorry. That's what I was 
Um, the existing or the proposed height is going to be 20 feet, 10 and, and 8 inches, counting the, the counting the base. Yep. No, the the height, the height difference is pretty extensive. They're, they the new regulations in 2018 really limited sign height. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't say you can't build a berm to put your sign on, but the height is measured from the um average or the lowest ground spot, you know, next to the base to the top of the sign. Um, so the, the height is a big difference. Um, and the sign area isn't a lot different, but it is different. Um, I want to say, I, I said in the staff report, it comes out to about 41 square feet, the six feet, four and nine sixteenths inches, I think comes out to around 40 to 41 feet square feet in area. Um, which when you look at it, I think it's a big sign that compared to um, the 32 square feet probably doesn't look all that different. It's right. the height that's really makes the mm -hmm. difference. I would suggest the that the people that wrote the statute height. should have taken in consideration size of the lot, yeah, speed of the road. Uh, I mean, just take a look at that picture. That sign is small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. our, like, our LED lights that light are, are another eight, 10 feet higher. So what we're trying to figure out is how to make that, how to make it, how to make it work. Sure. You know, and, 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 and that's the, yeah. You know, I, 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 like I, I said, I, I actually think it, that, you know, um, I don't know whose who's job it would be, but I really think they ought to revisit this uh, statute for, because this is this is going to come up. I, we, we know. We know. Also, yeah. And there's also an issue that we see with dealerships frequently um, when, you know, they're, they're parking cars out front and you've got a truck, you know, a pickup truck that comes to, you know, six, seven feet tall. If you were to have a sign that's only 10 feet tall, it's lost. <laughs> so that's why you tend to see a lot of the higher dealership signs, the sign that's above the top of the vehicles. What's... um. That's what board will move forward here. I feel like we've discussed a lot of the sort of details of the uh, of the nonconformity, and I, we have a good picture of like what's going on in the application. Um, in the staff report, I mean, we could go down the pathway of uh, of you know sort of the reviewing the variance criteria, uh, you know, in which is Figure uh, four two Section forty six zero three. I mean, I'll be honest, I reviewed it, and I'm not. <laughs> Oh, not very, not very convinced based on our discussion so far um, that it necessarily applies to our discussion. Um, but I'm interested in other board members of whether we want to try and go through that or not. Yes. Um, it, to me, it really feels like we're having a discussion around what, um, how we define kind of normal repair and maintenance. So yep. I don't feel like I need to go through the criteria. And I can appreciate the challenge with this and feel like we need to make a choice that's just, that's going to make logical sense. I can get behind the, this, this class of, this could be classified as normal repair and maintenance. That's a, this this description of, of what's been happening and what needs to be done to to fix the sign i can i can fit that in this definition for myself okay. i i would be on board with that approach i agree for the most part um i don't think we have to worry too much about setting precedent here because right. and we should note this that the sign is not changing at all, like at least the physical sign that's going to be there. It's going to look exactly the same. The height is going up slightly, but that's to make the bit foundation safer um, or safe. And then they are moving it, but they're moving it away from the right away. So I think any other potential uh, you know, applicants that come wanting to move their sign around they were to fall within those then yes we'd be setting a precedent but if they want to do something else like a new sign we're not setting a precedent in that way so i'm i'm comfortable with calling this normal repair and maintenance and i would note that the 
movement of the sign brings the sign into conformance with regards to placement. Right. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. They did want to move it, moving it towards, you know, away from the right way, I should right. say, would be something that we're setting a precedent for, but that we want that anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a there's a safety concern here uh, generally uh, about uh, the incentive to uh, keep these signs repaired <laughs> when it comes to foundations. And you know, twenty feet tall is no uh, no small height for a structure to fall from. And well, I always love Pete Catherine to it invoking climate change into our arguments that the storms that we've had, like we've seen, <laughs> uh, you know, I would I would hate to. Uh, it's, a, it's the heavily salted road from City Montpelier. I would I would hate to say don't replace this and then uh, have it fall down on that, that car. And well, that's on us. But um, so I, I think we've had a, had a good discussion on this. Um, the general is not an easy one, and I think that the regs are make this one difficult. But I think it's the job of this board to to use use logic and really uh, figure out what um, what we can do. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to have on the record as well the thoughts around the relevance of um, frontage and uh, mm -hmm. speed. That's obviously not something that's going to uh, get addressed in this meeting, but I think that's been yeah part of the context here. And I agree with you that it's uh, yeah there's a safety issue here, and you don't want to create an incentive for an unsafe structure to be in place longer than it should be. So. I guess I would just make that note also that you know that that their the signage of what's appropriate on 302 for signage is really different than what's appropriate on state street and mm -hmm. unless our rules deal with it better that this is a helpful way to proceed awesome and i will take a bunch of these comments back to the staff for the planning commission thank you so my understanding is that we have a motion that this proposal can be classified as general repair maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Group. Do you see any other question here that we need to answer? Nope. So uh if you're approving it, actually, um what you would be doing is probably sending it back to me to issue an right. administrative approval permit um but sense. guidance Oops. on and yeah we don't yeah. have to issue the, say that why well, instead of making it's, a ruling if, if it's no longer a variance if it falls under the exemption then it would be something i would have been able to okay. issue so what you're doing is you're not issuing a board permit right you're making a motion to to, to well to basically send it back to remand it back to the zoning administrator to issue an administrative minor site plan amendment and sign permit okay. as discussed because the it falls with as long as you guys agree with how i put out the landscaping my understanding and my interpretation is it falls within the exemption for landscaping which was the only other potential question in there um so but do we need a motion to remand this to the planning office? Uh, well, to the zoning administrator. To the zoning? Yep. Right. Motion zoning to remand to the zoning administrator to issue an administrative um, minor site plan approval and sign permit. It, with with the conditions that the placement be in conformity. Yeah. As as proposed. Mm -hmm. with the, 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 the sign would be put up as proposed with the the set the new positioning right the 10 foot additional 10 feet back which makes it in conformity. right i mean it's kind of an interesting uh decision we're, we're forging here mm -hmm. um i've seen those in, in other towns um, as a way to do it because it's it's not something if you're saying nope you misinterpreted it it should have been repair and replace you know repair and maintenance then that means that i should have issued that permit but so to you for interpretation. So Rob that. will not sign as chair. This will be entirely under your um, purview. We'll still need a decision. The decision, decision will still have still to be remitted right. to her. The, yeah. the, the decision is sending it back. Yep. There's still a decision that Rob has to sign, but then it's an administrative mm -hmm. like 
permit and it, it, it's it's still you know so there's still the 30 day appeal period on the decision right sure but it's administrative permit. right it's administrative action okay we have a <laughs> we have a motion i might just say so moved <laughs> it comes a wide range of uh, she said possibilities joe everything she said i will make that motion <laughs> i will second that motion all right we have a motion by joe and a uh second by um sharon um is there any discussion on the motion i guess i just uh, one other thought to throw in there on all of this is that you know, might have a little bit of something black because it was a maintenance issue because it was moving, but it's really moving to be in more in compliance so that if they hadn't moved it at all, it really would just be maintenance and repair. But the only reason they're moving it is to come more in compliance. So that, that seems like another kind of a problem area we should look yeah. at. Later. Another thing to go into the planning. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, thank you all for the discussion on this. Uh, seeing no other comments, we'll. Uh, um, go for a vote. Kevin, how do you vote? Aye. Sharon? Aye. 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 Yes. All right. We have a yes from Catherine, yes from Joe, yes from Abby. Uh, do we still have Michael? Yes. And yes from Michael and Rob votes yes. So that is unanimously approved. So, time. Happy New Year. Thanks, Thanks, we'll go New Year. back to the zoning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your patience on letting us work through this because this was not an interpretation I could really make. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. And, uh, so this time, uh, my employer was involved in the uh, preparation of the application for um, the next thing on the agenda. So I will turn this meeting over to Sharon, the vice chair. Um, Thank you. And wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks, Happy Rob. New Year. Thanks, Rob. Hey, Rob. So, are you ready to this? Yep. Okay. Um, so, I just wanted to go over what we're going to do, uh, just the process. Um, there'll first be a staff summary, um, and then the applicant will do a presentation about uh, what they've got going on. Um, then we'll have questions by the board, and then we'll open it up to public comment. Um, there have been uh, a lot of people who have given written testimony, which is great, and that's all on the record. Uh, there's copies of that available here, and that information can also be picked up at the planning office or the planning, yeah, planning, planning department. Office, planning department office. That um, material is available. Um, it seems like we have a fair number of people who would like to comment, and so I would uh, encourage us to um, civility and brevity are the key words of the night, if we will. Um, having said that, uh, I'm going to question I get up in there. If we have a bunch of people that are going to testify, can we do a group swear in? Oh, yeah. No, this was, I would, I would definitely do a group swear in everybody remotely and in person that wants to, thinks that they might want to speak. Right. Um, even if they don't know for sure, if they think they might, then they should be sworn in. Okay. Um, maybe let's do that now. Um, everybody who is interested, both at home on Zoom or here, uh, please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. Yeah, I do. We, will, I do. we will kind of assume that there's lots of hands yes. and yeses <laughs> online. I've got, every, I think I've got everybody's name down, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I guess the other thing that I wanted to just make the board members aware of is that um, we always have the possibility of going into deliberative session. We also have the possibility of going into deliberative session at a later time, so that if tonight's activities were to run long and we felt like we wanted to take time and think about it or talk about it, we could have a deliberative session not on this night also. Yeah. So just put that out. Um, with that, um, Mark, you want to roll on the staff summary? Yeah, um, I'm going to try and keep this fairly brief because we do have a lot of people here, and I think just about everybody's fairly familiar with the application. Um, so this is coming before the Development Review Board um, because it is the final application for a campus development under the planned use development um, chapter in our zoning regulations. 
Um, this was designed to allow for a sort of cohesive development of either commercial or academic property, various different um, options. It could be like a hospital, a campus, um, to allow different parcels and buildings to have a plan for future development, um, potential changes of use, um, potential new development for, for parking and shared parking that lets the board basically approve this plan. That plan does not negate the need for future zoning permits for incremental changes. So um, under this plan, there's discussion about future potential parking areas, or there's some discussion about um, a limited range of um, potential changes to certain buildings, maybe to make them ADA accessible or things like that. Each of those incremental steps, even if this even if this PUD request is approved by the board, each of those incremental steps will still need to go through a permit process um, and get reviewed each time those come forward. Um, but how some of those changes could be approved could be amended by this plan, by the board's decisions on this plan. That's the, the use aspect. And that's one of the biggest um, changes that this proposes. And I think based on the public comments that I've shared with everybody, one of the most controversial potential changes. Um, so I will, that's, that's what I've got, unless somebody has a specific procedural question. This was, this was before the board about a year ago for sketch plan. It did go through sketch plan where it was all um, an informal discussion. This is the part where an actual decision needs to be made um, before the hearing is closed. Um, and people's like you said, you swear everybody in. So it's okay. official testimony. Let's get rolling. How's our applicant want to come up? The applicant can yeah. approach the seat. Uh, and feel free to shift the chairs a little bit if you need to so that both of you can get to the microphone. Yeah, do your do your best to speak into the microphone. That way everybody remote can hear you and the recording secretary. You can identify yourselves. Uh, I'm Katie Gustafson. I'm here representing Vermont College of Fine Arts. Um, you are going to need to speak up. I don't know if you can turn on the um, intercom, whatever, the speaker. We'll see if it creates too much feedback. If it does, you may just need to really speak up so the people, ooh, people behind you. Too much feedback. Try it again. Try again. I'm Katie Gustafson. I'm here representing Vermont College of Fine Arts, and I'm here with David White, um, who the college has engaged to help um, with the campus master plan. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, did you want to give a brief overview of what the plan is proposing? So we um, had a master plan that expired and we've been in the process of trying to create one um, to fit the zoning requirements. Um, as Meredith said, we were here about a year ago with a draft um, and based on feedback that we re uh, received from the board at that time, sort of put more specifics around the plan, the college is in a period of transition. So uh, the campus master plan uh, is trying to um, contemplate uh, different uses in the future um, so that there can be um, a, a vibrant, um, fully utilized campus at some point in the future. So, excuse me, frog in my throat. Um, I do have a presentation I can make that's kind of an overview of, of what we're proposing to do and a response to some of the staff uh, comments. That said, there's been an awful lot of public comment, some of which we've had a chance to, to read through but not fully reflect on. And I'm not sure what the best use of time is. Happy to give you the overview presentation. I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint uh, presentation I could make. 
um, or we could just launch into questions. Uh, questions. So it's really what the board thinks is the most, the best use of time. Okay, thank you. Thoughts? Okay. Very helpful to see the big picture. Yeah. Okay. And especially if some of what you're doing is addressing some of the staff comments. Yeah. I think it that's... does to some extent. Yes. So I've. Uh... Kevin. All right. Uh, I, I would I would agree with the other members and their uh, wanting to get the overview picture. Also, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that we can take uh, uh, information in any form, um, and we can do this. Doesn't all have to be done today. Yeah. You know, if we get up to the wee hours of, of the evening, we, we can <laughs> we can adjust our schedule to fit that. So it sounds like. Oh, did you say? Oh. No, I was just taking the okay. glasses off. Do you want to miss it? So, it's, so it sounds like a um, brief Great. presentation. So I do have a thumb drive here. Put it right into that computer if you can find a free USB. Right. There should be one. Let's see. Ah. So. Put my glasses on. What do you know? Let's see. Bear with me here. Uh, need to find what drive that is. I'm only seeing the C drive, but can you? Yeah, let me see it? what I can do. Do you have a name? The thumb drive? No, but it should be. It should just pop um, up. It should pop up as a name, as you know, drive B or E or something. Sorry to get in your space, can you? Mm. <laughs> um, we can take the best yep, yeah. try that. Yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe. 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 Okay. Don't break that. Okay. So you touch pad, open it up, and then you're gonna need to do share screen okay. once you've got it open so that everybody remotely can see it as well. Yeah, the touchpad is tricksy. I need to do. You need to go back to the. Okay. Zoom. 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 And get it there. Go share screen. And then go there. Okay. And let's just. There we go. All right. Great. Okay, so thank you. Um, and again, for the record, I'm David White. I'm president of White and Burke Real Estate Advisors. We're based in Burlington. Um, I know Montpelier rather well, having lived here many years, having actually gotten married in the backyard of 25 Ridge Street, just a few houses away from this uh, site. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, so let me talk a little bit about Vermont College of Fine Arts. As Katie said, it's in a transition period that's all well known publicly. And um, the campus is going to change. No matter what, it's going to change. It'll no longer be functioning the way it has been functioning. And the question is not whether it changes, but rather how and what's the process to get from where we are today to ultimately those uses. Um, and the zoning ordinance sets forth a um, of the process for seeking approval for a planned unit development for a campus planned unit development. And what we have done is to follow the process that's set forth in the zoning ordinance itself that says, okay, tell us what you think you might do. What are the uses that might be there? How do they, they come together? And um, that's what we've done. And this is part of a 
uh, the, I think we're at the, at, at, uh, I wouldn't say the beginning, but we're at the middle point of a discussion with you as a board and with the neighbors and community around, uh, you know, what those uses might be and how we proceed. Um, and with respect to the, uh, uh, the setting up the PUD, the zoning ordinance says you need to establish a purpose. And I've tried to very briefly thumbnail it here on this screen, but basically what we've said is that we're anticipating this to be a mixed use campus that will uh, uh, enable adaptive reuse of the existing structures um, so that they are uses that um, the, the structures have a purpose. They don't just sit there and be vacant and crumble over time. So what, what might those be used for? And we're uh, one likely scenario here is that it will be continue to be predominantly academic. Um, there are other academic uses on the campus in addition to VCFA today, but also continue to be mixed use as it is today. There are mixed uses. One major significant change that could occur, um, this is far from a decision, but it, it does not seem unlikely, is that some of the structures, particularly a couple of the dorms along College Street, could be converted to housing. Uh, they are not especially suitable for other uses, and as we look at the marketplace as a whole, there are many things that seem rather unlikely. You know, there's not a huge amount of demand for office space, for example. So I think converting some of those dorms to office space, not impossible. There could be a business that comes along, but it seems unlikely. Um, and so as we look at those kinds of things, what might, uh, 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 you know, something uh, like, uh, Noble Hall, what, what, what might that be used for in the future? And housing seems like one likely scenario. So as we look at this, um, we're, we're saying we think it's likely to continue to have some academic uses, uh, whether that's majority or not, and to have other mixed uses similar to the kinds of things that are today in Schulmeyer and Stone, office uses and so forth. Uh, and it's likely that housing would be added as a component of all of this. And so that's kind of the gist of, of what we're looking at is how do we make effective use of those facilities the, that are there and so that they really make some sense in the marketplace. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, that didn't work. Let's try. Didn't work either. I'll do it this way getting used to somebody else's computer. All right, so as we look at the academic and mixed use uh, scenario, um, we are, there's certainly the possibility of the sale of the campus or a substantial portion of it to other academic institutions. Um, that may happen. Uh, there are discussions underway with a range of possible interested parties. So that is certainly a, a, a scenario that could happen. I'm not saying it will happen, but it could happen. Um, and that, but if that happens, similar to what's going on today with the Vermont College of Fine Arts, I would expect that excess space would be leased to other users uh, on the campus. So there would still need to be the opportunity for some of those buildings to be adaptively reused. <clears throat> That said, we do anticipate it continuing as a campus, a unified whole. Um, it's very likely that it will become a condominium. Um, that's not an absolute certainty. I, I suppose there's a scenario where buildings get uh, sold off, in which case they will no longer be part of, um, they, they'll, no, they'll no longer be eligibly part of this campus PUD. The campus PUD rules say that you've got to be under common ownership. And we anticipate, in fact, establishing that this will be a condominium where the condominium will own the land. The condominium units in this case will be individual buildings, unlike, say, a residential condominium where they're just individual, it may be a, you know, a multifamily structure with individual units. This will be the entire building would be individual condominium units. But the land will be held in common and operated in common by the condominium association. Um, and but it is possible that some of the buildings would get sold off separately, as some have been historically sold off separately. In which case, it would not be continue to be part of this campus PUD. 
Um, right now, we don't know whether that's the case, but it's possible. And again, we're trying to be transparent and full disclosure. We are not proposing any new construction at this point. I have highlighted, we have highlighted in the application that uh, we anticipate that for handicapped accessibility, ADA reasons that we will need to add or buyers will need to add elevator stair towers. I think it will be fairly minor uh, additional construction, but we do anticipate that that will occur. But at this point, we're not seeking a specific approval. Those, as Meredith said, will need to come back for their own zoning permits at that time. Um, so at this point, there is zero new construction proposed, nor would approval of this give us authority to do any new construction. We would still need to get approval um, for that going forward. Um, so this is the campus today uh, as it stands, and I assume most people are familiar with it, but it, just to be clear, we've got the campus green in the center with College Hall, and a total of, if I recall correctly, it's 11 buildings, am I right about that? 11 buildings wrapped around. There used to be more buildings owned by the college, but uh, along East State Street and West Street, but those were sold off previously. Uh, and today it goes from Dewey um, on the West, wrapping around to Stone and Schulmeyer, and then those buildings along uh, College Street with some undeveloped land that's behind the buildings on College Street as well. So, <clears throat> People may or may not be aware that the existing campus is not just the college. In addition to Vermont College of Fine Arts, there are two other schools there, uh, the New School and uh, Patcham. The Vermont, uh, state of Vermont has a Vermont State Training Center where they hold sessions to train people. There's a, uh, for various programs and needs they have for their staffing. Um, there's a food service contractor who that has uses the commercial kitchen down in Dewey and provides both food service to the campus, but also um, food services elsewhere. Uh, there are various office uses that are leased out in uh, primarily uh, Schulmeyer and Stone. Um, in addition to the campus being available for community meetings and, and outside organizations to, to rent spaces temporarily for conferences and so forth, and gallery spaces. And then the green itself, as I think the community is well aware, gets used for various uh, community athletic type activities. Um, regard to proposed uses, there is a table that we provided. Um, I will say that since we submitted this, um, we have uh, done a little bit of further thinking and there are a few additions we would like to make to this table. And I do have hard copies that I can pass out to people. That is great. Um, but let me say that the, uh, we've tried to be very clear in the table, you'll see in the original one and in the one that I've got here, that those uses that are in green along the top um, are those that are currently conditional uses that in the application we propose go to permitted uses. Um, I want to be clear about that, though, that the fact that they're permitted uses doesn't allow us to build anything new. We would still need to get a permit to build something new. We need to go through site plan approval if we needed to build a new building for it. Um, this is simply providing that the uses would be permitted uses on the campus. And I've heard loud and clear from, uh, again, I haven't had to be able to read every uh, email and so forth that came in, but I've heard loud and clear, there's a lot of concern about that. And, and we're, we will absolutely be listening to the community feedback on whether these are the appropriate uses to ship from conditional uh, to uh, permitted. But nonetheless, the ones in green, we've tried to be very clear, which is why we put it into a table about which ones we're proposing to shift. Now, in yellow, uh, as we thought about this, when we originally submitted this, when we talk about the three smallest buildings on campus, which are Crowley, Martin, uh, and Gary, um, we had really not thought about some uses that in subsequent conversations we realized could possibly uh, be appropriate for those buildings. So we are proposing to add a few uses to uh, what we're requesting would be uh, shifting from conditional to permitted, um, and I can pat, take a moment to pass that table out now um, because I know those questions are significant or I can delay until I'm done and pass them out after. So just for- Yes. You aren't adding any new uses across the top of the no. table. You're just adding the, the, the little X marks as to the possible locations where those uses might occur. Thank you. Yes, okay, that's, just making clear. that's clear. 
Yep, because that, so, that was my understanding. Yes, you there's, no new use. Yes, there's no You're new right. uses here. It's just that, and this is something that it gives the, if the board approves this kind of change, it gives them um, options for potential ways to limit that that use conversion, right? Because they have, they have said, oh, these are the buildings where these uses could, we, we could envision them occurring here. So it gives you places to say, okay, well, we, we might approve this conversion from conditional to permitted, but if so, you can look here to say, well, maybe you can only do it in, you know, Gary Library and Crowley Hall. You can't do it anywhere else without coming back for conditional use review, right? So, okay. That's important clarification. Yeah. So we would be approving or not the shift from conditional to permitted building by building. You you have that option. This has never been done before. Okay. Right? This okay. is I tried to be thoughtful in what I suggested in the staff report of ways to, you know, because there can be a yes, there can be a no. Right, the board can just say yes or no, or they can do a conditioned approval to say, okay, you need to amend your campus master plan to limit when these uses can actually be permitted uses so that you're minimizing the impact on the neighborhood. Okay. And that was one possibility. Thank you. That that was helpful. You're welcome. And let me add to that that, you know, although I was not here in the sketch plan process. But what I understood from that, um, and perhaps misunderstood, uh, but what I understood from that was that the board was looking for this kind of table, which uses might go to which building. And so that's what we've tried to do. We've spent some time really thinking about, you know, certain properties, certain buildings simply aren't suitable for certain uses. And um, so we've tried to be, that's why we've set it out in a tabular format, is to give you that level of specificity. Would we love you to say, sure, all uses in any building? Sure. But um, we've, we've, you know, laid it out in a way that we think um, is thoughtful. So why don't I move on and I'll, I'll pass these out. That's fine. Okay. So um, one of the questions that, that I, I, I somehow missed something here, I believe, bear with me just a moment. There we go. I went What's going on here? Doesn't like there it. we go. All right. So one of the questions that came up, uh, there were two, there were a couple of questions around parking that came up. And one of them was this question around the angled parking uh, that we showed along uh, West and College. Now, I should say that prior master plans for the campus have pretty consistently shown, if you go back, and we've got them going back to quite a few iterations, show it on West and College and East State Street. And based on some feedback that we got, we removed it on East State Street entirely, but we kept it on College and um, West, believing that that could conceivably work in the future. And I want to be clear that um, the, the, the concept plans that we've shown um, actually slightly cut back the green and leave the street uh, travel lanes uh, sufficient width to meet the city standards. So there's a little bit of a cutback on the green in order to make that work. Um, that said, I did see the staff feedback uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Lines, I believe it is at the DPW, that that may may not, he didn't say it wouldn't be, but may not be approved. So we said, okay, what what's the impact of that if it isn't approved? And this table shows that. So you'll see the existing parking in the left-hand column, which is sort of green or, you know, on the screen here, on my screen, it's pink. But anyway, um, 234 spaces existing today, including 36 that are on Weston College that we get to count because the college owns both sides. Um, if no new spaces are added on Wester College, total existing and potential parking spaces hits 295, we've, which is a little bit less than what's shown in the application. Um, and then the question came up, well, what about winter parking, where it's alternating sides of the street? And staff speculated that maybe there'd be 16 spaces lost. Our count is actually 18. We lose a couple more than staff estimated. Um, and that's because of uh, the way it works with um, one side of college having 18 spaces, the other has 13. And interestingly, the day that 18 are available on college, zero are available on West. 
and the day that 13 are available in college, five are available in West. So either day, 18 spaces are available on street. At any rate, this table is intended simply to show that we still believe we have enough spaces. It's, it shows the potential for up to 277. We may never need those spaces, right? This is, we're trying to show what could happen. And indeed, again, I wanna emphasize that we're not seeking approval tonight to actually construct these spaces. Uh, this is showing, this is a master plan, it's a concept, and when and if they're needed, we would then come back and seek uh, site plan approval to actually construct one or another of these uh, additional areas. And I'm not saying we will not come back and ask for spaces on Western College. I'm just trying to indicate that we believe we still would have enough uh, if we got to that stage. So then the question also came around traffic and the question of whether there, we should be doing a full traffic study right now and so forth. And, and from our perspective, the answer is no. Um, we're, it's not, we're not willing to do a traffic study in an appropriate time, but this doesn't seem like the appropriate time. We, the uses that we have put forward are speculative at the moment. Uh, we did put forward in one of the tables, I guess table E, a possible combination that seemed relatively likely of what the uses might be in the building, and what the parking demand would be for that, but we don't know whether that's going to happen. So it seems premature. And we were struck by uh, the staff review comments suggesting that perhaps what would happen is you establish a threshold. And once we're over a certain number of cumulative trips that would be generated by new uses, that then the, the traffic analysis would have to be done. Uh, and that's what would happen at a conditional use. I mean, in the conditional use process, um, if you hit 75 trips that impact a, tra a class one road, you've got to do a traffic study or 50 trips on a class two or three road. Well, the roads in the immediate vicinity are all class two or three. Um, and so we're suggesting if we hit 50 trips that we would need to do a traffic study at that time. And so um, that requires us establishing a baseline. Where are we today? And uh, staff ad did ask us for uh, providing that and it being the holidays and all that and our traffic engineer went off on vacation with family. We haven't been able to get that data yet, but we, we can produce that for you and provide to you a baseline of what the existing trip generation is for the campus that provides a basis on which uh, successive applications, and this is something that would have to be tracked, uh, and I'm, I have no doubt that the staff would do that. You know, if we start with these trips, then, you know, if we apply for uh, a new conditional use that requires whatever it is, 20 trips. Okay, we only have 30 left before we've got to trigger that, that uh, tra traffic study. But that seems appropriate because the uses today are so speculative. And so what basis do you have for analysis? We don't know how many trips we will actually be generating. Um, so it's not against it, it's just premature. Um, and then there were a number of comments, um, uh, particularly relative, uh, and I did pick up on this, the um, concern about the, the campus green. And I want to be absolutely clear that um, we're not proposing any changes other than I did mention slightly narrowing in order to do the angled parking. Um, other than that, we're not proposing any change to the college green, nor would approval of this application authorize any changes to the college green. Um, now, staff suggested the idea that perhaps um, there should be some official condition that makes it or reserves it or something. I would suggest to you that the two things. One is that you may not want to do that because if you look at your own ordinance, it says um, that if you reserve land, it can't be used for any active recreation. And the community uses this pretty actively as playing fields. And so it might actually hinder what the community wants to have happen here. So I think that particular mechanism probably is not the right way to go. I would also say to you that, um, it, that it's unnecessary, that there will be, it, when and if ever, we have no proposal to change it, when and if ever a subsequent application comes forward, there'll be plenty of opportunity at that time for there to be discussion around whether this should ever be, whether it should happen or not. But as we stand here today, we are not applying to change that green other than potentially a slightly narrowing for the angle parking spaces. And that's basically it in terms of the overview. I hope that's helpful. Questions? 
Yes. Uh, could you explain why you want to change these uses from permitted to or conditional to permitted? permitted? Sure. Um, well, first of all, the zoning PUD process asks us to propose uses that you know we think might happen on the campus. Um, and so uh, to be perfectly honest, we that's what we did. Uh, initially, it didn't strike me as uh, potentially as controversial as it turns out to be. And perhaps I'm just too naive. Um, but the, um, it, it, so we were being responsive to what the ordinance itself calls for. That said, um, there, there certainly is a benefit to um, making it easier for us as we talk with potential users to say, okay, this is now a permitted use. If they're proposing to adaptively, but I want to be clear, to adaptively reuse existing buildings, not to build anything new, you would still need to come back for site plan approval and so forth to build something new. So this is all about adaptive reuse and trying to um, facilitate the process of moving that along. Um, it's a, I'll just say that my experience, as I think about this, for an, as an example, if we were to propose uh, find uh, that downstreet housing, hypothetically, uh, and I've not talked with downstreet, I want to be clear, but hypothetically, we're interested in converting Noble into 12 units of affordable housing. Um, you know, the way their funding and timing works, you want to move that along as expeditiously as you can. And it being a uh, conditional use makes it a, slows the process considerably versus being a permanent use. It's that simple. Okay. Thank you. Um, is the, uh, is the college green there? Um, you talk about, there's a, I noticed in the application, a 31% open space portion of your planned master, the, the planned development. And is that, is that in part of, is that considered part of it? Uh, well, let me be clear. The campus today, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the campus today, as you look at the entire acreage, there's only about 20, there's about eight and a half, nine percent building coverage, and maybe about 27 percent uh, total lot coverage. If you look at all impervious surfaces, and I'm not sure that data point is in the um, in the submitted materials. Um, so that the campus today is over 70 percent actually. Uh, green space. If you look at the entire acreage of the campus, um, the uh, and the green yes is a piece of that. Yeah, I think so. I'm just going to do a quick share screen. This might help, Sharon. Um, do I need to unshare? Uh, I I took it away so I could see people, so I could see if somebody was having problems. Um, so, I believe when you were counting what you consider to be the shared common space you did count the green but also like these green spaces here in front of yes. the buildings and all of those green spaces as common open space and you weren't actually factoring this in as common open space even though you mentioned it when you're trying to get to your percentages but the problem is if you're saying that the college green is used for active recreation it's not designated. This is something that the board may need to think about. The College Green isn't designated as an active recreation space, right? It's not a tennis court. You can't count a tennis court as a common open space. Um, the College Green is sometimes sometimes used for that active recreation, but that's not what it's necessarily designated right. for. So where you're going to draw the line there on what counts as the reserved common open space and what kind of conditions need to be placed on that in the campus master plan. So it can stay green. It could be used for different people's active recreation, but it can't be, they can't convert it to a football field, right? Those are some possibilities and things to think about. Right, so that you can have active recreation on it. But I mean, that doesn't, that common doesn't open mean space, that... people are gonna set up, you know, the, games. The, the use is transient. Right, the, exactly, thank you. The use is transient. <clears throat> that's a great I have a question that might be more for Katie I think when we saw the um 
sketch plan about a year ago. It was before um, there was any public news, at least that I was aware of, on the mm -hmm. transition for the college. So the context is obviously different from, you know, talking about the PUD with the college in operation here and with underutilized buildings having a change of use versus what we're talking about now, which is more of a transition for the institution. So can you talk to us a bit about, um, obviously this is a transitional point, but what you foresee for, you know, the immediate uh, academic, I suppose the, the wording in the application is that there's continued administrative sites here. So can you talk to us a bit about kind of what you anticipate there? So the VCFA will keep our administrative offices in College Hall and keep that entire parcel, which includes the green. Um, but as David explained, as we move forward, as you know, buyers come into the picture, it will be shared. All of those campus resources, including the green and the parking, among other things, would be shared resources. So. Um, I'm not sure if there was more in that question. That no, I, th I think that that's helpful. Okay. If I may just elaborate on that <clears throat> to underscore the point that assuming we go forward with the condominium concept, um, which is not an absolute certainty, but I think is likely, then I would anticipate that the college will no longer own the green itself. It'll own College Hall. And the green will be part of the underlying land that the condominium association owns and operates and manages. So I, I did have sort of questions about that condominium association idea. Sure. And just a little like maybe, you know, <laughs> if, uh, if there were details that went with that, what you had in mind of setting up a condominium association, is that something you're anticipating doing? In, where did that might come in your plans? So, yes, we are anticipating that. Again, it's not absolute certainty, but I'd say it's highly likely. Um, the So I think when most people think of condominiums, they think of, you know, a residential condominium. It might be, you know, a set of townhouses or something where each owner owns, uh, you know, uh, their individual unit. And the condominium association is typically responsible for all the land, all the grounds, for all the exterior of the buildings, for the roofs and so forth. That's very common um, and the most typical kind of condominium association. But there are also commercial condominiums. Uh, one of them some of you may be familiar with is uh, on Shelburne Road in South Burlington, Lakewood Commons. That is, you know, a mix of buildings, but it's all commercial uses. There's no residential, but the basic structure is similar there in that the condominium kind of association owns the ground and is responsible for the exterior of the buildings, including roofs and so forth. This one's a little bit different because the buildings are not attached, and um, what we're anticipating, and but it's only technically different, is the condominium kind of association owns the ground, um, and that each the condominium kind of unit would be the entire building. Each owner would own the entire building and be responsible for the entire building. So the exterior walls, the roofs, and so forth. And that's, to that extent, it's different than the typical residential condominium. And more like a land trust mechanism almost, where the land is owned separately. Yes. But it, but in fact, is typical for condominiums. This right. is the way it really uh, is typical. And the, um, the management, the uh, each condominium owner would have certain voting rights, um, uh, and we haven't worked these details out whether it's based on square footage or you know what it is. We've got to still we're working on those kinds of considerations how that would work, and that they would then the association would then in turn be responsible for ongoing management, whether they do it directly by hiring staff, which is less likely, or by bringing in an outside um, service to do that. Typically, condominium associations will hire external service to, to do all the ongoing maintenance. And then in turn, you assess fees back to all the owners to pay their share. However, then again, that gets prorated among the users. And so I've been involved in some, this is a mixed use condominium, which gets a little bit trickier, but I've been involved in one up in Burlington that uh, some of you may or may not be aware as a condominium, but along Battery Street, where you've got um, the Marriott Hotel, and then around on Cherry Street, you've got the Hotel Vermont, 
um, and behind it, there's some parking garages and there's also a residential condominium there um, called Westlake. That's actually all on, a, uh, it is all on common land and it's all a condominium with different uses and uh, different fee structure, depending right. on what they are and different voting rights. But it's a mixed use in quite analogous to this mixed use condominium. Thank you. What's the ownership structure of the condominium? Um, typically what happens is that the um, individual, that collectively the, the owners of the individual units own the land. So there is no external involvement here. And ultimately we would anticipate that Vermont College uh, Fine Arts would be just one more owner, not the dominant or controlling interest here. It'd be one of the owners in the condominium and have voting rights. However, that ends up being apportioned. Questions, other questions from the board? I, I guess I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it sounds like everybody went on vacation and that there's traffic data coming, but, but that seems like a really important piece to me mm -hmm. um, that without a baseline of, it would be pretty hard to determine what was okay and what wasn't okay. And uh, it just seems like that's that's information that we should really have but kind of kind of think. Um so to kind of I agree that. with you actually. <laughs> I kind of think that so, that would be uh, let me say we will provide that. You know, we don't have it yet. And um I I haven't had a chance to talk with our track. He was supposed to be back uh today, I guess, I'm assuming. Anyway, I haven't had a chance to talk with him since he's returned from his vacation. So um we will, but yes, we will get that. Um, are we ready to open it up to other folks here? Um, I guess I'd like to open it up first to um, to abutters who have not yet commented in writing or in person. And just a quick note, I did get a few more emails between the batch that I circulated <laughs> and getting here because I could only process things so much. So when we get there, I do have um, emails um, just so that people know from uh, Mark Greenberg, Emily Donaldson, uh, Amanda Sardonis, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Leah Greenberg, and Susan Calza. So just so that you all know, we do have those. It sounds like there might be a continuation. So I'll be able to get these to you. Um, before. So do we have a butters that are on Zoom or in the room that have not yet commented that would like to? Yeah, yeah. it's not yet submitted a, a written someone who if we are butters who haven't submitted written comments, um because I do have all of those, then uh we to raise your hand. I think we have we have at least one raised hand on Zoom so far. I'm not seeing any in here, are you? Can't see around the poll. <laughs> All right, so we have to see Dan Toll remotely. And we go. Well, oh, you do it. Like I said, I couldn't see around the poll. Oh, sorry. Uh, so do you want to do in person first or remote? Uh, first? Let's do the in person first. Please come up and uh, identify yourself. And if anybody, I did see some people sneaking in when we were in process. Please make sure to sign the sign in sheet if you're here in person. It might be an issue of swearing in. Oh, yeah. Were you here for the swearing in? No. Okay. <clears throat> um, can you raise your right hand? <laughs> uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains of penalty? I do. Perjury? Thank you. I'm Sean Sheehan, 5 West Street. I'll be brief with my comment. I know there's a lot more. I just wanted to point out, I think a lot of the question kind of being new to a lot of this process and kind of what happens and permitted and conditional uses. Um, I think a lot of speculation about why why the changes and how would it change the process? And I think the point that was just made with the example about if there was a housing unit going in and what the financial uh, ramifications would need to be and what that would mean for a slower process versus um, more quickly, you know, that, that feasible side, I think that was um, helpful, at least to me, won't speak for, for anyone else, but I think kind of trying to make sense of it all and understand kind of what was the difference um, that piece. That 
Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And who was our online person? Uh, Dan. Dan, oh. you want to unmute yourself and testify? Sure. Um, I am, as I indicated at the beginning, Dan Toll. I am a uh, live in the DCF a neighborhood on First Ave. I'm also the head of Parker Advisors, the consulting firm that was hired by the city of Montpelier to look at uh, housing insecurity, affordable housing, and the unhoused here in Montpelier in Washington County. And I just wanted to put my vote in for at least to postpone the vote uh, at least a month so that we can maximize the dialogue between the public, the municipality, and the college. Uh, two points. First, I see this as an opportunity to create an even more vibrant community with housing options across, potentially, across the uh, income spectrum. And secondly, I'm really looking forward to this conversation in considering all the options as we work towards an optimal mix of housing, uh, not only in this uh, neighborhood, but across the city and across the county. Thank you. Other folks who would like to comment? Um, hey, what we'll do is we'll alternate. We'll go one in the room and one on Zoom, then one in the room. <laughs> um, gentleman on the left, you want to start? That's you. Okay. Yeah, we got to have you go to the microphone so right. people remotely can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. I appreciate the hard work that this board is doing. I appreciate that we've all submitted a fair amount of paperwork that it's going to take time to read through. I'm and sorry, I, can you identify yourself? My name is Danny Sagan. I live at 31 First Avenue, and I've been sworn in. Uh, I do want to say that um, I've lived at 31 First Avenue for 19 years. I've enjoyed living next to VCFA. My daughters got their training wheels taken off uh, on the green, and I've been... Uh, I volunteered for the City of Montpelier from Montpelier Live through the Downtown Committee, and I've been a volunteer member of the front gallery. I'm a, I'm an architect. I share a design practice with my wife, Elisa Dworski. I teach at Norwich University and at Norwich, we've designed and built housing for homeless folks uh, within the mental health system. We've built these in Barrie. I've worked uh, directly with Downstreet Housing. I've seen all the good work that Downstreet Housing has done, and they've done a lot of good work using permitting processes that are already in place, which use planning review and design review boards like yourself to review their projects before they move forward. I will say that I'm not naive when it comes to the difference between permitted review and conditional review. There is no need to expedite reviews without input. The permitted review process pushes a project to approval without any notification of the neighborhood, without any notification of this board. That is not an expedited process, that is a process without review. So I feel very strongly not to shift these conditional uses to permitted uses, especially when it comes to housing. And I trust people like Downstreet know how to operate within the system that already exists. I would like to make the point made by the report that Ms. Crandall so very eloquently said within your report on page 16, that during the gap between adoption of the current regulations in January of 2018 and now, VCFA has had to obtain zoning permits based on the individual parcels it owns without any of the benefits supplied by a campus development PUD. These relatively recent permits include a subdivision, a change of use, a request to use an old tennis court for temporary surface parking and others. All of this was done within a process that already exists, already exists within the town of Montpelier, city of Montpelier. So that's my general comment. Thank you. My specific comment is short. There is a hedge between my property and the property that's protected under the PUD. This hedge has been maintained by the owner of the property, VCFA and the owners before VCFA, to standards that were written into a master plan that was agreed upon. There's no mention of my hedge, or not my hedge, excuse me. There's no mention of the hedge that is owned and maintained by VCFA in this master plan. If this condominium comes to fruition, who's going to maintain that hedge? 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, someone on uh, Zoom? Yep, we have Erin uh, Aguayo is on with her hand up. Hi, um, we more than abut the college. Our home was a Vermont college dorm for 30 or 40 years. So we're, we can hear the primal screams at midnight and we can hear all the whistles from the soccer games. And, and so everything the college does has had a direct impact on our lives. And I would be more than hesitant to give them more free reign to develop without significant oversight. They have been largely unresponsive to any concerns, dismissive, and I uh, definitely think that they're already permitted to do all kinds of things. And they've sent a real estate investor, investment, a real estate agent to represent them tonight, as opposed to a college representative. And I am um, just nervous about them getting even more pre-approved or less oversight uh, permissions. So that's, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, someone in the room? Yeah. Hello, I am Elisa Dworski at 31 First Avenue. We are in a butter next to Dewey Hall. Uh, I am married to Danny Sagan. Um, I have a master's in architecture. I teach as adjunct faculty at Norwich University in architecture. I have serious concerns about this proposal, but first I wanna take a moment and just thank you for all your time. And I wanna thank everybody in the community who is here and online and has sent in letters because I think one of the big issues here is about community involvement and about maintaining the right for the community to weigh in on changes in use on the campus, particularly under the conditional uses. Because I concur with Danny, there's a huge difference between um, the notification process, the hearings that are required under conditional use, the time and opportunity for community members to reflect on conditional uses, ask questions, and then, you know, actually have a chance to have a dialogue. With a permitted use, my understanding is that the zoning administrator, if, if an application meets those requirements, the permitted use, they have to then approve it. And there is no discourse with the community. There is no input, there is no refining, there is no opportunity for you to amend, it's done. And that really makes me very nervous. And as other people have mentioned, there are a whole long list, which are in my letter, of um, already existing permitted uses. But I want to take a moment because there's so much. And I'm sorry, there's a lot to talk about. This, this application came very late, came in December in the holiday season. The staff report came on the 29th. And as a community member, I've been reading this starting just 36 hours ago, and it's really scaring me that we don't have time to really understand fully what's going on here. But what I do understand it is making me very concerned. And I concur with the other person who spoke online. We need at least another month, if not more as a community, until there is an, an another hearing. Certainly there shouldn't be a vote until more members of the community have a chance to weigh in. I do have a question about that, I, I, which is, I submitted a letter. I know a lot of people submitted letters. If you have not voted yet, can other community members with having more time to look at this and ask questions, submit letters going forward and have standing? Yes, as, as long as the thing itself has not been closed. Okay. New testimony, new evidence, new plans, new, that they can because continue to be submitted. One of my concerns is that the application is, is, is very dense, and I think it actually obscures a lot of really important information. And I'll try to touch on that briefly, and it's in my letter. But the fact that it's that dense means that we need community members to have time to understand mm -hmm. what's going on and respond appropriately and have a voice. Um, 
Let me just return to my notes. And I really am trying to be concise. I appreciate I, I do, I do appreciate that. But I also feel that because the community hasn't had a chance to fully review this, that I can give a chance to uh, underline some important points for people who are online now. All right, so I think delaying the vote is important. Um, I also wanna just say, I personally, and I'm pretty confident about this being true of many of my neighbors, we want the campus to be successful. We want you to be able to have multi-use and transfer this, or at least I will say for myself, you know, to, to, to other, to a new life, a new vibrant life. We want success, absolutely. We are reasonable people and it's in our self-interest that you be successful. We want the buildings full and vibrant, but we want a voice and we don't want this particularly conditional uses change to permitted uses and lose our voice. One argument David has made is that, hey, we're not gonna build anything. There can be discussion in the future, but this is an example of the obfuscation that is taking place because if conditional uses change to permitted use in this, then as I've pointed out, we don't have much of a say in the future. Sure, we can have a say, but it, 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 you know, if we know the permit's been pulled. So I think that's insincere to say, oh, we'll have the conversations later. This is very important right now in terms of our retaining those rights now. Um, hold on, there's something else. There's other things I wanted to respond to in terms of David's comments. He mentioned it's all about adaptive reuse and facilitating the process moving along. As Danny said, we can do that now. He also talked about how conditional use slows the process. Slows the process, yes, because it involves community engagement, which I think is really critical in our democracy, in the character of our neighborhoods. And I think if you have faith in your community and your neighbors, and you want them to be engaged and you want it to work as a neighborhood, you allow them to have that input. But um, you know, the other reason, which I think they may not be talking about, is they're trying to sell this property. And it will be more valuable to potential buyers if community members do not have as much possibility to engage because we could delay things. We're not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to stop something, but just by asking questions and having to involve the community, well, that takes energy and engagement, which is what a developer or a campus should have. But sure, if they get rid of that, it may have a greater monetary value to them. But why at the price of my engagement? Right. I would ask. That really concerns me. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna just quickly go from any notes. Um, kind of quick, I mean. Yep, I'm gonna try and wrap it up. I just wanna make sure, um, first of all, the delay needs to happen because there've been so many letters. I mean, how could you possibly vote? You haven't absorbed what everybody said and we need other people to have time to weigh in and understand it themselves. I need time to talk to the staff and understand the staff report. It was very dense. Okay. Um, and I also want to say something that's insincere uh, that David said, that, which was, he said it came as a surprise that the community would oppose the idea of conditional uses being transferred to permitted uses. This was raised a year ago and in community members meetings extensively. So I, I don't believe that, honestly. Wow, um, so, uh, that's basically what I want to say. And as regards what Danny said about the hedge, it's not that we're only just worried about our hedge or the hedge between it. It's an issue that in the document, it's very vague what happens to outdoor spaces. It talks actually about how VCFA um, acknowledges the hedge, but not what happens when it's in the new condominium ownership. So there's a lot of evasive language that's saying, oh yeah, we're concerned, but in the new structure that goes out the window. There's nothing being said about how outdoor spaces are being used. For us personally, if there were a restaurant next door, outdoor allowed seating would be a concern. We want to be able to weigh in on that. We're not opposed to a restaurant, but that the details matter. And we want engagement through conditional use to weigh in on that. And there are many other issues that come up, like the green, et cetera, that are in our letters. 
parking, sound, et cetera. I mean, you know, parking, sound, boundaries. Um, I can't even list them all. But the point is, it's not to, um, we just we just want the details and we want to be able to have those discussions. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so Donna um, has had her hand up the longest. Okay, Donna? Hi, um, am I? I'm not muted, right? No. You're not muted. We can okay. hear you. Good. Hi, I'm Donna Ackerman, and my house abuts the college land. Um, my house is at 10 Kemp Avenue, and um, I've owned the house, I think, for 45 years now. We share a property line um, with the college, and because we've been there so long, there have been issues that have come up and up over the years with different owners and different administrations and all those things. And I would not support any change to make something not a conditional use. I feel like it's so important that the neighbors have the opportunity to weigh in on lighting and noise and boundaries and things like that, because every change creates some ripple effects and too many changes without oversight can really change a neighborhood. I live in Montpelier only part time. Um, the rest of my time I spend outside of Boston and I've worked in affordable housing for 36 years now. And I'm aware of how slow the process can be, but the process is slow because it's so important that the end product of any kind of housing and especially affordable housing, and perhaps especially people who may need more services than regular tenants who are just buying their first home or something, those details all need to work in order for um, a change of use in a neighborhood like this. And I, I just need to share that I'm very nervous about uh, rumors I hear and um, things that may or may not happen. I think I've been to every meeting and I'm going to try to do my best to continue to stay involved. I appreciate the time. This is not easy for anyone. Mm -hmm. And I too want the college to be there and um, in any fashion that that works for the neighborhood and for them. But I do think money and time is what is pushing things so quickly. And um, I think people need to be involved and we need the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have someone else in the room? I live on Tracy Street and I've lived there for about 40 years. Your name? Juliana Fector. And um, Dewey is right in my backyard. So being there that long, I've been to many meetings, many changes over the years, the community action familiar with. And I'm just curious, I do remember many of the discussions included the fact that this, this land, the Vermont College was in a master plan, supposed to be there in perpetuity as an educational organization. Um, I must have missed something because that seems to be like not mentioned at all. And what I would say is what, what has the effort been to find other educational institutions to come in? Has it just been, a, I mean, the, motive, the motives for not having it are much more lucrative. So I guess I would just put that out that that's my concern. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Phyllis Rubenstein. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Phyllis Rubenstein at 15 College Street. Um, I submitted a letter this morning and I will try not to repeat what's in my letter. I first have a question because I'm one of the people that just started reading uh, the staff report 36 hours ago or less. And looking at table B, so I first have a question and then I have comments. But what I don't know what it means on table B, proposed permitted use, is I understand that what's shaded in green is where um, 
the college wants to change uh, conditional use to permitted use, but those uses that are not, that are uh, just, um, that, that aren't shaded, are those, uh, what are they? Are they currently conditional uses and will remain conditional uses or are they permitted uses? What are, I, I don't know what they are. They're currently permitted uses. Yeah, they're currently okay. permitted uses. My okay. understanding is that the because during sketch plan review, so many people wanted to know what uses the applicant envisioned being on campus, they included the ones that they also saw as being potential for the college buildings um, in this chart to, to meet that requirement. It was a question from the board. It was a question from the public. Um, but it doesn't, that doesn't, those, the, listing those there doesn't mean that other uses that are permitted in the mixed use residential district couldn't later be used on the campus. You know, any any use that is permitted in the base um, zoning district would be a permitted use on the campus, whether it's in that table or not. Okay, thank you. During David's presentation, he said that um, the the purpose of the uh, plan would be mixed use with adaptive reuse, academic and mixed use like today, possibly adding housing. When I look at table B, there are eight categories of uses that have to do with housing. And some of them are residential housing, um, but under the uh, items that they wish to change from conditional use to permitted use are multiple unit dwellings, five or more, a group home, a major in congregate living. There is some definition in their plan of, um, I forget, I think it was of congregate living, but there's no definition of the, or uh, of uh, group home, I believe. And, and, and there's, for both of them, there's no indication of, how large these facilities would be. I am particularly concerned about uh, parking and traffic. Uh, David said that, um, that in prior master plans, they showed angled parking on West and College Street as well as East State Street. Well, I would question how old are those prior master plans? Were those master plans uh, approved before or after Town Hill Road going into East Montpelier was paved because, well, I, I've lived in Montpelier since 1988, and I originally lived off of Town Hill Road. And, um, and I've lived in my current residence for over 22 years. So I have seen traffic increase on both Town Hill Road and um, on College Street. I, I disagree with uh, what I read that most of the traffic on College Street is for residents. I walk up and down College Street. The cars that I see start at Main Street, go all the way down to Barry Street. And I don't believe that the traffic is primarily for local uh, residents. I think it's for people that are using College Street as a bypass of downtown. In the uh, college um, plan, they also designate or identify College Street as a minor collector uh, route, whereas East State Street is a major collector route. I don't know if that's accurate. I would... Um, and I think that a traffic study is imperative. Uh, I think it'll show that um, College Street has a tremendous amount of use. It also has bicycle use. Um, and any incursion on, on the street and any additional parking, especially I, I think angled parking would make it more dangerous for bicyclists. Um, I also agree with what others have said today that 
There should not be a vote tonight that there should be an opportunity for more of the abutters and uh, neighbors to comment on the plan. And, and as others have said, my goal is that community members continue to have a voice in the permitting process, which um, the change of from conditional use to permitted use would eliminate. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, do we have someone else in the room or shall we go to Susan Labarth, if I'm pronouncing that correctly? Labarth. No, I'm welcome. Thank you. Good. Oh, I was so happy to see Julie there. She's my next door neighbor. <laughs> um, I've been on Tracy Street for, I think, 36 years. My um, I share a property line with the college. Um, and um, I just wanted to uh, uh, reinforce uh, practically everything I've heard uh, from the audience speakers tonight. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, the transfer from the conditional to um, permitted use. Um, and I, I have a kind of a, it's a minor example. It doesn't have directly to do with permitted use, but it does have to do with a permit request that was administratively approved uh, without any input from neighbors. And that was from a neighbor who wanted to have a party that was going to go late into the evening with a rock band and 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 loud, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, amps or speakers, you know, anyway. So I wake up to loud rock music at, I don't know, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I drove over there and uh, asked them to please uh, knock it off and was told that they had a permit. Well, they just went down to City Hall and got somebody to sign the permit. And uh, I don't think that was an appropriate use for a residential community. Um, so uh, that that's just kind of a, a tiny example, but an annoyance and something that shouldn't have happened in our residential community. Um, and then where um, Danny uh, is fortunate to have a, a, a nice hedge that the college owns, I have a fence. I don't have a fence. The college has a fence that runs along my back property line as well as that of my next door neighbor whose uh, address is 29 Ridge. And um, uh, yeah, I have the same concern. Somebody can maintain that fence. Oh, they have just replaced it because it was falling down, threatening to uh, threatening to collapse on our cars and so forth. Um, and I really appreciate that the fence has been replaced, but who's going to take care of that in the future? And one last thing, I think that over the years, there have been times when uh, there was, uh, oh, some kind of a concern or issue or something. And as ownership of the campus has changed, the um, attention and responsiveness uh, to those kinds of issues have changed. Uh, things like noise from the dumpsters, which are right behind me. I mean, you know, a few steps from that fence. Um, uh, uh, let's see, um, rodents and so forth <laughs> running around back there because of um, refuse from the from the kitchen and uh, the dumpsters, dumpsters not being kept closed and so forth. They're, they're, they're just a few of the things that, that went on. Um, but from time to time, there have been issues. So it's really important for uh, us neighbors to know who owns the property and who's in charge of those things and kind of what the agreements might be about who's maintaining what. Um, and and that's a little um, that's a little concerning to me as we contemplate change. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Right. Do we have anyone else who would like to testify? I don't see anybody else on Zoom with a hand up. Making a mistake here. Uh, oh, Phil Dodd just put his hand up. All right. Phil, you're on. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity. 
I just had a couple things to say. One uh, about those the parking that we were shown, uh, both in the original and and the modified version. I'm not a fan of the angled parking uh, myself. I think the staff report talked about uh, some danger to bicyclists and DPW wasn't sure they'd approve it. Um, I, I also wonder, there are various peninsulas, if you look at that, those plans that stick out into the road. I, it's hard to see how a plow could could go along the, uh, with those in place and, and, and clear out the snow. So uh, I guess my first comment is, I'd prefer to see the the presentation we saw tonight, where there was no angled parking. Um, it sounds like that's sufficient for the college, and if that's the case, that's that's the uh, result I'd I'd prefer. Um, the second uh, comment has to do with the green. Uh, the angled parking would also take little bits of the green, which it's just a little bit, but it's a start. Um, I do want to say I really appreciate the college. Uh, how the college has made that green available to the public. And it's, it's a tremendous resource for the neighborhood. Uh, and I, what I, I'm concerned about is, is the long term here. I know the college does not want to do anything with the green now, but um, who knows in the future, eventually a condominium association would have the ability to do something there uh, if a majority of those people in the association voted that way. Uh, I'm not sure if there's some way through this uh, master plan process that, that there can be some, some way to preserve that uh, and keep it from being developed. Uh, if there is, I'm in favor of that. If not, I'd be in favor of somehow money being raised or, or the development rights being purchased or something because I think it's really a unique asset. And uh, as I say, the college has been, been generous with it uh, and it'll be a shame to lose that. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks, Joe. All right. I'm uh, kind of embarrassed to say this, but I may need to recuse myself from this uh, application. Okay. Um, my father-in-law owns a house on East State Street right across the street from them, and I manage the property for him. I'm starting to realize, listening to testimony, that I might have personal opinions on this, and mm. I don't think I can... You know, I'm not going to say which way they go. I'm just saying I don't think Joe, I would be able to rule. Joe's personal opinions. Joe, I I would, I would. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you disclose your potential concern, I think in an instance as you're describing, I would con consider that to be sufficient. I mean, um, I mean yeah, I think you, you're not the direct owner; you're managing it on behalf of. It's. But on the other hand, you don't feel like you can make the decision objectively. That's the then key. that's your call. No, I do feel like I can make an objective decision, I suppose. But there is much greater than zero percent chance that it passes into my family through my father-in-law. Ah. Oh, he doesn't intend on selling it. I mean, in instances like that, it's always your call. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to lay out a scenario where I've been in the past, uh, where. Um, you know, I just try to keep those two yeah, things separate. Decide. It's okay. also whether or not anybody else objects and thinks you can't yes. make an objective decision, right? If somebody else is objecting and saying, nope, you, we want you off, then definitely you would want to probably well, use yourself at that point. But if you think you can sense. make an objective decision and nobody is contesting your ability to do that, then you could, you know, it's it's kind of your call. Uh, I guess if the applicant has an issue with it, they should raise it now. Uh, yeah, we he owns 106 East State Street, and it's a four-unit rental that I manage. I'm the property manager. He lives in South Carolina, so he's like I. If you ask them, they would say I am the landlord, even though I don't own it. Um, does that make I, any difference to I you mean, guys? I think that you're fellow board members have sort of said to you the framework that you should think about it in. And I, I think that that all makes That's sense okay. and seems reasonable. I don't know if you would say anything. No. Okay. I feel confident as long as you, if you feel that you can make an objective decision, and then, then I'm willing to go with that. And all right. I do. I want to make sure you're okay with it. Well, then we've all seen you work and how thoughtful you are. So. All right. 
appreciate that. Uh, I'll stay on. I already said through all the testimony. I know. Don't leave us now. Thank you for thinking of the it because I know your involvement with that parcel and it didn't even occur to me either. I can so. just didn't even think of it. I don't know why. Nope. Maybe it's, because it's across the street or something. Because we have a lot going on in our lives. But at least it's been publicly stated now for the record. Yes. So where where's the board at? I don't think we have the information we need to take action. I honestly don't feel like we do either. Um, but I'm not I'm not quite sure what the next step is and what that information that we need to gather and digest. I'm not sure what the next step is because this is unique. Can I give you a couple of options? Sure. <laughs> so if you know that there are very clear things that you want in, in addition to the traffic information that they've already that the applicant has already said they're going to provide, um, if you know what those things are, you can make those requests now. Um, so that that's can be on its way and the applicant can get that guidance. Um, and then of course, you know, motion to, to table the application to a continued hearing or just motion to continue the hearing to date certain. Um, you can also, if you wish, in addition to that or combination with that, um, make a motion to also hold a deliberative session between now and when the hearing is continued. If we don't have a, you know, we don't have to decide on that date right now. That can be an administrative. I send around us, you know, circulate some date options. That deliberative session is, you know, close to the public, um, so we could just have it be a Zoom call. Um, it could be tonight. It could be some date between now and the continued hearing, so that you can then come up with the, you know, I'll talk and come up with the list of things, narrow down exactly what new information you need, and I could even do sort of a a report memo out of that that is shared both with the applicant and can be put in the file publicly um, and would go in the packet for the next continued hearing that would include any additional written comments we got from any members of the public between now and that continued hearing, any new submissions from the applicant, all of that would be in a updated packet that would get posted with the agenda before the next meeting. Um, is there, um, does anybody know of information they want specifically that you might be able to tell the applicant now? I definitely want to see traffic through them, yeah, there is which is coming. Right. Um, so, um, Other specific requests people know of now? I uh, um, agreed with the point of one of the commenters that um, there's not sufficient information here regarding the future of the green as such an important asset for both the neighborhood and the community at large. So I think that is something where there could, you know, I think we got kind of a verbal affirmation that the college intends to not do anything with the green. But I think there could be more uh, detailed information, both about the green and about open space mm -hmm. overall. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, curious about additional steps or protections that could be taken with the green in particular. Uh, deliberative session. Are people interested in doing a deliberative session? I would I would vote for it. If we did go with a deliberative session to not do it this evening, to schedule it at a later point. Not, yeah, not I agree. No, I, I, I would like to have a deliberative session, not this evening, but at a different point. And I would agree with that as well. I think that would be the pause that we need to, uh, in a very deliberative way, uh, yeah. gather additional information yeah. or come up with the the uh, sources that we would like to have for additional, additional information. As well as read the additional comments. Yeah. Written yeah. And comments I, that I mean, be able to share with you and everything. You know, and then allow pages. And I think it's really important to just allow for more residents in the community to to digest the information, to provide comment if they would like to. I think that's important. Uh, I'll state too, yeah, for the record, there's a comment around, it is the timing with the holiday period. So I think that also underscores the need to have extra time and agreed that a deliberative session could be a good venue for a more thoughtful discussion on what additional information is needed because it's both very complex and um, yeah, and we received the, I think everyone here ever did their best to receive the comments, but we can, 
be more uh, strategic with uh, the liver. So, um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, we, we came in with a not, not quite the Sears catalog, but, you know, approaching uh, the JCPenney catalog uh, this evening and haven't had a chance to go through it. Uh, uh, our hearing schedule. Mm -hmm. um, Hey, Meredith, can I, this is Michael Lazorczyk, can I interject real quick? Sure. So I, I disagree that a deliberative session is the right path to go. I think if we're concerned about transparency and an open discussion, doing that in a deliberative session doesn't make sense to me. I also think it's important to go through the staff report start to finish in a public hearing to address what's actually in the report and what is in the zoning bylaws, what we can actually decide on and what isn't simply comments or complaints about what may or may not be happening. And I think we need to keep it focused on the zoning bylaws. Now, I know there's a lot of vagueness on both sides, both the commenters and the applicant, but I think it should be transparent and I don't think it should be in a deliberative session and I think we should leave, whether it's tonight or the next meeting, with clear guidance to the applicant. For example, if I was the applicant, I wouldn't know what guidance or direction or steps I need to take at the close of this meeting. Thank you. Mike, I'd like to push back on that just a little bit. Um, I think that there is value of having a deliberative session. Um, I also presume that we would do a continued public hearing and that we would bring our deliberations to the public hearing and that people would, you know, that we would talk about what our process was and what we considered and that it was not, um, you know, it's not a, not a secret handshake. It's um, a way for us to sort of make sure that we're covering all of the bases. Um, and we do have a date available to right. continue the public hearing so that there would be that opportunity to come back right. and talk with the public. Further. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I, my idea and what I would be suggesting, sorry, that the board members do, there wouldn't be any decision in that deliberative session. Um, there wouldn't be, you know, th there would still be the whole process of going through the staff report and the criteria and the continued hearing. It's just that there's been so much information downloaded, especially with the, it's about a hundred pages of written comments that I know I haven't had it, I haven't been able to read. Um, that that gives the board members time to look through that and discuss a little bit to to give the applicants guidance in a public way, if you wished, to direct me to basically make a little memo that is a public document so that everybody knows what the the gist of the guidance was that comes out of this deliberative session. It's not a decision-making deliberative session like the board's used to. It's a consultation deliberative mm -hmm. session. Um, this is something that that the planning director, Mike Miller, he and I talked about it, that that is something that the board can do where no decisions are being made. It's just a chance for you all to discuss and hash out without staying here till 11 o'clock at night and, and making every, you know, and, and still not having a decision. Does it's that make sense, Michael? It's a working session. Yeah, it's a work. It's a working session, but we have to call it a deliberative session. Right. I, I mean, I guess we can just agree to disagree. I mean, I think this should be done <laughs> open and transparently. I don't see the value of moving into a deliberative session, however we frame it, to then provide a document to people that's a synopsis of the meeting, to then have a public meeting, to then uh -huh. potentially provide guidance to the applicant. It just Wait, seems so too convoluted <laughs> to me. And I think, yeah, it's a lengthy document. I know there's a bunch of comments. I mean, I work all day and I read through everything you sent me with the exception of, of whatever you sent during this meeting. So there is some onus on us to be prepared and, and I get it, we're all busy folks, but I just think it should be done as transparently as possible. And, and I'll just, that's fine. I can end it there with my comment. So just as a FYI for everybody, including members of the public that are on here, there are no more development review board meetings in January this year. This is it for January. So the next potential uh, DRB meeting is February 6th. 
So that is the closest next meeting we can have on this. Um, and we're right now, we don't have any other applications for that date, um, but other applications come in. So they would, you know, they would be on for after whatever this public hearing continuation would be if this continues to the, to the sixth. Um, and then potentially also get bumped. Uh, I do have, we do have Peter Kelman on remotely who wants to make a comment. So this is just a, the, the idea of a deliberative session gives the board the opportunity to hash some, some things out um, and review these materials. It's not something that has to happen. It's an option. Okay. So we have someone who wants to speak. Yeah, Peter Kelman. Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter Kelman, um, I, I used to live in, on College Street. Now I live in Mount, Mountain View. Um, I, I, I want to address this to the uh, applicant. Um, I have urged developers to begin by talking to the community, not end by talking, listening to the community's complaints. I would urge you to take advantage of whatever time between now Excuse in the me, next public could, meeting. Could you um could you address the board? Excuse me? Could you address the board versus the applicant and just sort of oh, well I, okay. I, I, I think it would be it would be good for the no, I can't because I think that <laughs> it, it's just one of the procedural requirements, Peter. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I would suggest that you suggest to the applicants to take time over the next period between now and when the next meeting is to actually work with the community to get this kind of feedback and, and a kind of uh, dialogue going. Um, I witnessed this with the Habitat project where they brought they brought member people who had started out being very scared and nervous like many of you are, and they brought them in and they did a charrette and it was it was a fantastic experience uh, for, for everybody. So I, I think that it, it would be good for you to advise the applicants to try to do something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Can I make a comment on that for more? Helpful, brief. Very brief. I just want to note that at the last community meeting that was on the BCFA campus with the applicants and a lot of community members, I can't recall who, but someone specifically asked that after the master plan was submitted, that we have an informational meeting to engage the community. And Katie said that would not be possible at that time. So the community members distinctly asked for that involvement. And I will second that I have been involved with this since a year ago, and uh, we've gone to most of the meetings, one or the other of us, all of them. And I, I don't feel like anyone's, I've been told what's happening. I haven't been asked that much about what we care about Thank and you. engaged. Thank you. Um, I would entertain a motion um, to uh, continue this hearing mm -hmm. uh, until the February 6th. Can we just confirm that the applicants can attend? I think they can, but I want to double check. February 6th. Yeah, I, and I would also say if there is a way to get feedback sooner than that, I would really appreciate the opportunity. So again, I, I do understand you are a very busy board um, with lives outside of this, um, but I, I would welcome feedback sooner than February 6th and absolutely will be available then as well. And uh, so... So that's a meeting day, right? It's the sixth. Yes, February sixth. Um, I would propose that we have a deliberative session prior to that meeting. All right, I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion to continue this hearing to February sixth, and to hold a deliberative session between now and that time. <laughs> date time to be determined. And so just just a reminder for everybody. That two six meeting begins at seven p.m. Just like standard. Make a motion. Second. All those in favor, let's uh, start on the right. Further discussion. Further discussion. 
So we have to ask that question. Any further discussion? I don't see any. Uh, starting on the right, Kevin? Yes. Um, Michael? Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, with the caveat of the deliberate session, sure. Yes. <laughs> You can't have to write that as a no, Michael. <laughs> it's okay. No, uh, well, no. I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure everyone's going to vote yes, so I'll vote no just to stand true to my word, right? No, well, that's fine. Oh, yes. I'm going to go yes. Yes. I vote yes. Just because you vote no, Michael, doesn't mean you can't take part in the deliberative session. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I don't think. I think we've got everything that we did. Yeah, the, I took attendance. A motion to adjourn. Anyone? So. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. Fair yes, thank you, everyone. <laughs>